Good morning. I'm uh, Robert Greenhill, Managing Director of the Forum, and I'm very pleased to uh, welcome you back for one of our key plenary sessions on Asia's green growth agenda. But indeed, it's not just Asia's green growth agenda, it's everybody's green growth agenda. And at a time when uh, Korea is preparing to take on a leadership role globally as the uh, presidency of the, of the G20 starting in 2010, Korea has also been playing a significant leadership role leading by example on the whole area of uh, sustainable economy and uh, dealing in a proactive way with issues of uh, climate change, both in terms of policies and in terms of many of the initiatives in its recent fiscal stimulus package. It is therefore our great uh, pleasure to welcome, uh, to provide uh, his remarks and thoughts on this, Pri uh, Prime Minister Han, Prime Minister of the Republic of Korea. Excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank the um, World Economic Forum for their kind invitation to speak to you today. Let me begin by extending my warmest welcome to all of you gathered here on the occasion of the 2009 World Economic Forum in East Asia. I'm delighted to speak to you today on the theme of setting Asia's green growth agenda. It is an incontrovertible fact that we are confronting two global challenges that require immediate remedy and intervention. First, the global economic crisis has reminded us all that the security of our interconnected financial systems is still tenuous at best. The complexities of the exotic instruments in our capital markets today belie the notion that we can remain passive on regulation and oversight. If the economic crisis has taught us anything, it is that we need a new framework for collaboration, supervision, and crisis management. To be clear, I am confident that the market will eventually recover, and we are seeing some positive indicators of that today. But I make no illusions that the road is long, journey is arduous, success is contingent on all stakeholders doing their part. The second major global challenge is analogous to the first, with respect to far-reaching and cataclysmic cost of failure. The causality of human influence on the climate change is both direct and undisputed. The signs are clear and all around us, including alarming changes in glacier geology, vegetation, ice cores, dendrochronology, surface temperatures, and sea levels. These are not only looming threats, to the survival of humankind, but they are real and complex problems that need immediate solutions. Asian countries are particularly vulnerable to the adverse impacts of climate change. Many major Asian cities are situated along coastlines and are susceptible to extreme climate events. Two thirds of the world's poorest live in our region and they are the poorest, most severely and disproportionately affected by climate change. Thus, it is imperative that we act boldly, decisively, and without delay. Given world attention on the Millennium Development Goal by 2015, we need to see great progress on ensuring environmental sustainability. We need policies to reverse the loss of natural resources, inquiry to, and injury to biodiversity. We also need sustained access to safe drinking water and basic sanitation. The urgency of the challenges posted by economic crisis and climate change necessitate a comprehensive policy response. We must not view these two global issues as mutually exclusive. Rather, we need to construct a new and fresh approach, recognizing the symbiotic relationship between economic growth and environmental sustainability. Ladies and gentlemen, before I was asked to return to Korea to serve as Prime Minister early last year, I served as Special Envoy of the UN Secretary General on Climate Change. 
I also still sit on the Secretary General's Advisory Board on Water and Sanitation, and as a founding chair of the UN High Level Expert Panel on Water and Disaster. In both capacities, I traveled extensively, meeting world leaders and urging them to address climate change and water issues. In the process, I also witnessed a lot and learned much. I believe that a strong economy and a clean environment are not mutually exclusive, and that Korea has to take an active part in tackling climate change. Fraser Lee myung -bak, on the 60th anniversary of the founding of the Republic of Korea on August 15th last year, proclaimed low carbon green growth as Korea's new national vision. In a nutshell, low carbon green growth aims to shift the current development paradigm from the fossil fuel dependent quantity oriented growth to a new paradigm of qualitative growth, the green growth. It uses less energy and is more compatible with environmental sustainability. Korea's rapid economic development from the early 60s was a result of a quantitative growth paradigm where the major factors of production were capital and labor. In the new green model, which Korea has just adopted, new ideas, transformational technology, and innovations will become the more important factors of production. At about the time when Korea was embarking on the grow green growth strategy last year, the financial meltdown in Wall Street erupted, negatively impacting on real economy. Therefore, we had to rapidly supplement the green growth strategy with the short-term policy measures. Specifically in January this year, we initiated a Green New Deal policy. It aims to create a low carbon economy through green growth while stimulating job creation through New Deal. The Green New Deal policy is an amalgam of a long-term policy of enhancing growth potentiality through green strategy and a short-term policy of creating jobs and revitalizing economy through New Deal. This initiative is a combination of neoclassical supply-side economic policy with the Keynesian demand-oriented policy prescriptions. When we overcome the current economic crisis, the New Deal portion of the policy will be phased out, leaving only green growth as the major economic policy goal. In order to successfully implement the Green New Deal policy, Korean government will spend 50 trillion Korean won, roughly 40 billion US dollars, over the next four years. This investment is expected to create 960,000 jobs. The government also announced a blueprint mapping out 17 new engines of growth, which includes green technology industries, cutting edge fusion technology industries, and high value added industries. We are in the process of constructing a green growth five-year plan with a 10-year rolling plan. This may be the first attempt of its kind in the world. I hope that the Korean example will give rise to similar efforts in other nations as well. We have also established a presidential commission on green growth, co-chairman of which is over there, Mr. Kim, with me. A national assembly is currently in process of deliberating to enact a framework law on green growth. The legislation, when done, will provide both the institutional and legal basis for aligning all national as well as local rules and regulations with the new paradigm. By changing, adapting, transforming, and modernizing our economic system, the Korean government is working tirelessly to move forward beyond the current financial crisis. We are looking to creative, integrated and forward-thinking solutions that will also contribute to global reduction in carbon emissions. About a month before his official proclamation of low carbon green growth as Korea's new national vision, President Lee myung -bak announced at the Toyako G8 outreach meeting in Japan that Korea would become an early mover in greenhouse gas emission reduction effort. He also stressed that Korea would play an intermediary role between developed and developing countries and that Korea would like to contribute to the post-2012 climate change regime negotiations by further refining the Kyoto mechanism and relying on the Bali action plan. He also promised that Korea would provide 200 million US dollars over the next five years to establish the East Asia Climate Partnership. 
you know, to establish a framework for energy consultation, invest in R&D for green technologies, and provide financial support for its members. It is against this backdrop that Korean government hosted the first East Asia Climate Forum on May 29th, a ministerial-level policy dialogue on green growth measures. The forum included 60 high-level delegates from Korea, ASEAN member states, China, Mongolia, and Central Asian countries. It also included the head of international organizations such as ADV, UNEP, ESCAP. Over 20 field experts and 90 government researchers participated in the meeting as well. The forum culminated in the adoption of the Seoul Initiative for Low Carbon Green Growth in East Asia. The initiative outlined support for sustainable water, forest management, urban planning, and efforts to work toward better facilitation of renewable energy. In a similar vein, the ASEAN-Korea Commemorative Summit, which was held on Jeju Island in early June, discussed low carbon green growth as an important cooperative agenda. At the summit, participating heads of state and government concurred on the necessity and urgency in responding to climate change and agreed to strengthen cooperation in, this fu in the future. President Lee Myung-bao recently suggested that Asian countries, including Korea and ASEAN member states, ought to take the lead in carbon green growth strategies. Accordingly, the policy document on Korea ASEAN low carbon green growth cooperation was developed and includes detailed measures on strengthening regional cooperation, pursuing economic development, and combating climate change. He also proposed the establishment of an Asia Forest Cooperation Organization that would represent the region's collective endeavor on combating climate change. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that low carbon green growth must be a paradigm not only for Korea, but for the international community as a whole. In order to achieve a synergy between energy security, climate change mitigation, and sustainable development, particularly in our region, we need to strengthen mechanisms for regional cooperation in Asia. Asia is a region undergoing dynamic economic change. If Asian nations as responsible members and stakeholders in the international community collaborate against climate change and join in the pursuit of low carbon green growth strategies, significant contributions will be made toward ensuring the long-term security and prosperity of humankind. It is said that the hallmark of wisdom is in knowing how to turn crisis into opportunity. The word crisis in Chinese is composed of two meanings, danger and opportunity. Now that we are faced with the crisis, that is danger and opportunity, we must do our best and utmost to turning climate danger into change opportunity, the change for the better, the change for moving into a new paradigm of green growth. As stated at the outset of my remarks, we are confronted by two potentially catastrophic crises. However, the primacy of the current global economic downturn should not deter our forces, our focus, from effectuating a low carbon green growth agenda. Rather, we must seek intensive cooperation and unprecedented commitments from all, the, all stakeholders. Korea is not only ready to do its part, it is ready to lead this process. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Well, we heard a, a very thoughtful and, and strong uh, commitment to the whole issue of, of dealing with green growth, not just from a national, but also from a personal leadership perspective. Uh, of course, the challenge is going to be ensuring that there's a policy framework at national and global levels to deal with the issue of green growth. And there is also the opportunity and possibility and commitment to actually implement uh, these policy frames at the business level as well. If there was a case for private-public cooperation, um, this would be it. We have with us today uh, four eminent panelists coming from different national as well as different uh, industry perspectives. 
and I'd like to ask each of them in turn to provide their perspective. And perhaps uh, we can start with uh, Chairman Kim Hung Kook, who is the chairman of the Presidential Committee on Green Growth. And Chairman Kim, we heard a very committed perspective. Could you provide us a, a little more insight on what you see as these key developments, but also what you see as these key challenges, uh, particularly in the concept of implementing a five-year plan uh, for green growth, and what will that look like compared to some of the five-year plans in the past? Yes, Korea has announced that it will strongly pursue with the green growth strategy. The main reason behind such uh, declaration is that we understand the need to solve the situation regarding carbon fuel. As you all know, we are importing most of our uh, carbon fuel from abroad. With the situation of the depletion of the carbon fuels worldwide, uh, we have to be ready so that we can further continue with our economic growth. The carbon fuel is also, of course, uh, the main culprit of the worsening of the global uh, environment. In terms of fuel import spending, we rank among the highest in all the OECD countries. And starting in February 2008, the new Lee Myung Park administration has been showing a very strong leadership. This leadership falls in line with the strong understanding and the strong political commitment that we must make significant changes to further the development of our civilization. So the issue of how we can break away from our dependency on carbon fuel uh, is becoming ever more important. And under this background, we are focusing on the green growth development. And we have set up a presidential committee on green growth. And this committee is a coordinating uh, committee where of all the different ministries that uh, work on global uh, green growth. And as mentioned by the Prime Minister's speech, we are currently working on setting up a five-year plan. Since the 1960s, Korea has been very successful in industrial development. Such development was basically led by a five-year industrial development plan. So we have already experience in leading the national development through setting very specific plans with a five-year time span. And we are going to uh, apply the same format of setting up a five-year uh, development plan, but under a new and completely different paradigm of uh, low-carbon green growth. In early July this year, we will be seeing the early draft, and which will be reported to the president. The plan for the five-year development plan will be, will be serving as the basic uh, plan for the Korea's economic growth. Well, thank you very much, Chairman Kim. And it's, it's uh, going to be fascinating to see how Korea that has used five-year planning structures very successfully in the past as part of the acceleration of industrialization will be actually using it to accelerate decarbonization uh, along the, the, the industrial system that previous five-year plans created. So this could be a, a very uh, powerful model uh, for the future. Of course, uh, another country that's been engaged on the issue of um, green growth, both from the point of environmental uh, protection, but also from the point of view of uh, being a, a major importer of fossil fuels, is Japan. And so we're very pleased to have with us Tiaki Ito, who's the vice chairman of Fujitsu. And sir, I wonder if you could share your perspectives from Japan in terms of what has been done successfully already 
And what do you see as the key challenges to take this to the next level, both in Japan and, and more globally? Uh, thank you, Mr. Greenhill. Uh, my pleasure to have a great opportunity. Today, I'd like to discuss the idea how ICT can contribute to mitigate global warming and to accelerate the collaboration in Asia. I'd like to mention three points. The first point in the change in our lifestyle and the business style. The world is dramatically changed as natural resources such as fresh water, food, energy are very constrained. We need to use those resources more efficiently to ensure the sustainable global economy. ICT has the potential to reduce the world carbon emission by 15% in 2020. Thus, I believe ICT plays a significant role in mitigating the environmental burden today and in the future. However, to stabilize the carbon amount in the atm atmosphere, we need to reduce by half the current carbon emissions. The traditional approach can't achieve this target. To fundamentally solve the global warming, we need not only to advance our technology, but also to change our mind with a new world view. We need to change our life and business style, not merely to seek material wealth. As ICT fully integrated to our everyday life, it could be change agent agent to shift our thinking and behavior. With sensors and actuators and embedded in our daily lives, we can measure or visualize the energy consumption and the carbon emission in real time. ICT could make any data measurable, uh, reportable, and verifiable. This will help us in managing our future activities related to global economy. And the second point, creation of innovative technologies. The traditional approach can't lead to a sustainable society that satisfies both economic growth and significant carbon reduction. We need the dis destructive innovation that comes with new technologies. ICT can contribute to the creation of innovation technologies. For example, in the life science, the supercomputer can safely simulate virus experiment without using strict biosafety laboratories. We could find out about new virus beh behaviors and develop an innovative approach to control diseases. Artificial photosynthesis, turning sunlight into the new energy, is expected as a future clean technologies. A supercomputer will help us to clarify the mechanism of photosynthesis and make it practicable. When we focus global climate change, a supercomputer can show us the interaction between the different phenomena, such as the atmosphere, oceans, and ecosystem, and daily activities in the human beings. I believe ICT will integrate and enhance the human knowledge, which will ensure the sustainable society. The third point, collaborative R&D in Asia. ASEAN, 10 countries, China, South Korea, and Japan, have a total population exceeding 2 billion, while 30%, and combined GDP reaching $10.5 trillion, while 20%. Considering the rapid growth, the Asian GDP will exceed 50% of the world growth in 2030, and surely shown a greater presence. Cross collaboration among the Asian countries will create and use innovative technologies in the world's biggest market. Also, we expect the new and diversified Asian views will lead the global mindset in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Of course, when, when looking at Asia and looking at the issues of, of climate change, uh, it's impossible to ignore the, uh, not the elephant, perhaps the dragon in the room, uh, which is China. Uh, and in a sense, uh, a set of contradictions. On the one hand, now the largest emitter of carbon gases. On the other hand, on a per capita basis, 
much lower than any of the Western European or North American nations. Uh, at a policy level, uh, not yet uh, committed to uh, binding international targets, and yet at a, macro a microeconomic and domestic level, some of the most uh, exciting and innovative approaches to, to dealing with in environmental issues, including climate change. To help provide us with some perspective of the state of play right now in China, and, uh, and also what the possibilities might look going forward, it's my great pleasure to introduce Victor Chu, who's Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of the First Eastern Investment Group, and also a member of the Foundation Board of the Forum. Victor. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as Robert rightly said, China today is one of the largest uh, polluters in the world. Um, this, obviously, uh, is a byproduct of the 30 years of uh, industrialization of the open door policy. But we have to put all this into perspective. First of all, on a per capita basis, obviously, China is much, much behind from other uh, leading industrial uh, countries, but also in terms of what China is doing in this um, high growth, uh, low carbon strategy is much to be admired. And I would like to provide a number of highlights just to illustrate that point and to maybe look ahead to see how China, uh, Korea and Japan can work together to find some win-win uh, solutions uh, for us in the region and, in, in fact, uh, from a global basis. Uh, first of all, uh, as I mentioned, China is catching up. We started at a very low base in terms of our green uh, strategy. Um, but we have to understand that uh, in terms of G intensity, and that is the amount of uh, energy required to generate one unit of GDP, uh, China uh, has dropped 75% over the last 20 years. And of course, it's still looking very aggressively to achieve more efficiency from that uh, perspective. In terms of uh, a stimulus package, that's the four trillion RMB stimulus package announced uh, last November, uh, nearly 40% of that is green project related. And in terms of a percentage to stimulus package, I think China uh, is a leader in this uh, perspective. Uh, here, I want, obviously want to congratulate uh, Korea in this uh, remarkable efforts. What uh, the Prime Minister and Chairman Kim have just said really touched my heart. I think the, uh, the Green New Deal, if I can put it that way, uh, that will uh, generate 36 billion of investment and generate over, uh, well, about 1 million new jobs over the next four or five years is absolutely remarkable. And that sets up a really a new a benchmark for everybody to subscribe to. And knowing Korea, uh, it will deliver. Uh, I have no uh, doubt about that. So really, I want to congratulate our Korean friends for this particular leadership. Um, another thing we need to um, uh, understand is that China, um, over the, the, the last few months, have increased its uh, fuel consumption tax on gasoline fivefold, and the fuel consumption tax on diesel uh, eightfold. Uh, that's quite uh, quite serious. China is also having a expanding, a rapidly expanding, a renewable uh, energy sector. Mm -hmm. um, the wind installation uh, in China last year is only second uh, behind the U.S. China has the second largest wind power installation um, works uh, in the world last year, and uh, in our uh, current five-year plan. Uh, China hopes to achieve over 12% of its energy required through the alternative sector. Again, that is a huge and aggressive order. But also what's more important and more interesting to me is the cultural shift uh, within China. In the past, it is very well to have um, very high and very ambitious uh, standards uh, announced and introduced by Beijing. But once it gets to local level, uh, they were managed very effectively to protect local industries. But today, you know, certainly over the last uh, five, six years, I can see a fundamental shift in that. Today, when you talk to frontline officials, the mayors in, uh, in cities, in townships, they have a complete cultural buy-in 
that energy efficiency, energy conservation is also part of their own um, uh, best interests. So they will see much beyond just protection of local jobs because they understand that um, uh, pure growth for growth's sake is damaging and sacrificing our children and our grandchildren's uh, green future. So I think today you have a complete buy-in from top to bottom of the needs and desirability of this grand strategy. So I hope that in the future these policies and targets are much more welcome, much more effective in local implementation. And finally, in terms of uh, a macro um, impact um, of green strategy to China, I'd like to mention two points for your, for your consideration. In terms of the US-China's uh, economic and strategic dialogue, you'll realize that today, climate change and environment is top of the agenda. One of the reasons is that the Obama administration, following on the Bush administration's uh, uh, president, they're trying to engage China on areas which are uh, uncontroversial from a bilateral point of view. So we are talking less on very contentious issues, but much more on mutual issues. And climate change, education, uh, knowledge base, trade, uh, these are much easier for the country to engage constructively with each other. And likewise, the climate change and uh, environmental concerns are top of the agenda on the EU-China strategic dialogue. So these dialogues take place uh, at least twice a year. So what that means is environmental issues are at the front burner of the bilateral and international dialogue between China and its major international partners. And that's very important uh, from a domestic Chinese point of view in terms of maintaining and strengthening this cultural buy-in and make sure that we keep China's engaged, honest, and constructive in the whole process. And finally, Japan and Korea, of course, are the leaders in energy conservation and energy efficiency. The tri trilateral partnership between China, Korea, and Japan is real and present. And I hope, since we're all in the same region, culturally, we are the closest to each other, this China, Japan, and um, Korea a trilateral partnership will produce a lot of goods in terms of the climate change and the environment agenda. I think next month or in August, the leaders of the three countries will meet in Tianjin. And again, environmental issues will be top of the agenda. And finally, on the private uh, investment agenda, there are, as you know, a huge amount of capital being raised in America and Europe and globally on green projects. China's private equity industry has just opened up. Shanghai has just announced earlier this week regulations for international private equity firms to incorporate subsidiaries in China in order to raise local currency funds. And I think green funds will be very fashionable uh, in the foreseeable future. That again will be another catalyst to stimulate China's will, desirability, and interest in this particular sector. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victor. And uh, you know, a number of the key points, the, the issue of pricing and ensuring that the right kind of incentives are set up through the system is a fundamental and positive change at the last while. The changing in attitudes at the local as well as the, the central level. And uh, the increased international cooperation, not only at a policy level, but actually at a private sector level, are all uh, very important and positive elements. It's on this last item that uh, our last speaker will also discuss because at the end of the day, to actually implement these changes, we need to see uh, decarbonization actually take place along the supply chains of each of the different businesses involved in our different national and international economies. And one of the leaders of thinking on, on this is uh, Tarek Sultan Alessa, who is the chairman and managing director of Agility. Agility is uh, one of the most innovative uh, international logistics and transportation companies having grown from under $100 million uh, in 1997 to some $7 billion with 37,000 employees in, in countries literally all over the world, a real innovator in terms of uh, business models and an innovator in terms of the incorporation of corporate social responsibility. Tarek, how have, how have you been thinking about this issue uh, from your industry perspective? Well, 
First of all, when the government of uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, one of the um, um, most uh, well-endowed petroleum-based economies, announces that it's going to nuclear power, I think everybody needs to uh, take take a step back and and really realize the enormity of that uh, what that's saying. And um, so I think the first um, cut at this from a business perspective is that there are some real opportunities uh, here. Whether it's Masdar, which is a project that the government of Abu Dhabi is building a carbon neutral city from scratch, or whether it's the government of Singapore really developing innovative uh, water uh, technologies, um, uh, there clearly are some very uh, fundamental and substantial opportunities for business uh, to, to look uh, at this, uh, at this uh, space. I think it's becoming increasingly apparent that we do need um, a level of collaboration between these initiatives. There are many entrepreneurs out there looking to develop um, technologies and opportunities, and I think it would be great for those, for those entrepreneurs to have a platform that would allow them to really get more bandwidth for their ideas and uh, by really sharing uh, between what's happening in, in China and Japan and Korea and also Abu Dhabi. So I think that's, there's some ideas that we need to develop uh, around there. Um, furthermore, I think it's, as a business, it's becoming increasingly apparent that our customers are starting to, to ask questions uh, about these issues. Now, they're not yet making decisions on the basis of uh, your green credential, uh, credentials, but they are increasingly asking questions and demanding to know more about programs. So the next logical step is at some stage, this will be more and more incorporated into our customers' uh, decision-making processes. So it's incumbent upon us to, to, to really have a good answer uh, and to do something uh, about it. Again, from employee perspective, um, um, they're, they're a key stakeholder in this process, and it's something that's uh, really core to them. I think overall, though, at the end of the day, it's about being a practical approach. Most of us probably are thinking in the back of our minds, all right, sounds good. What can we do on a practical basis to actually make a, make a difference? And, and I think the first thing is that we need to raise a level of awareness and have somebody accountable in our or own organizations to do something. Just that alone can actually push the needle and move it in the, in, in the right direction. It's as simple as having somebody in a company, in an organization, accountable to make a difference. And um, we've seen that in our own company, even starting in a very modest way, having very fundamental uh, effects. But then, as you go down and you look at some of the ideas and some of the concepts that are really practical, and I, I have a you know, a brief list here, and I just wanted to highlight a couple of these because I do think they, they, they are pretty easy to understand. Um, clean vehicle technologies. Um, idea of de-speeding the supply chain. Uh, if you, uh, uh, in today's environment, given the, the problems that, that companies are having, moving inventory, I'm sure many of them would welcome if you, uh, if you said to them, look, by slowing down that ship that's coming, you can actually reduce fundamentally the amount of carbon that you're, you're, you're emitting on a sort of per good basis. So it doesn't really take uh, uh, a very difficult, it's not a very difficult sell in this market, but it also shows that it's about choices. And you know, so allowing your supply chain to slow down is a choice that uh, a business uh, could be made and something that should be discussed with a customer and provided as, a, as an option. Um, Enabling low carbon uh, sourcing agriculture. Again, a country like Abu Dhabi is, uh, is flying in uh, tomatoes, cucumbers from around the world. There's no reason to be doing that when you can look at the same sort of green, uh, um, uh, greenhouse uh, 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 technologies that are available in Holland and you can actually produce those goods just as easily in Abu Dhabi and probably a lower cost than you could in Holland. So there are many practical ideas about optimizing uh, companies' networks and looking at the way that you package uh, goods. And there's a, for any of you that are interested, there's a fantastic study that was commissioned by the logistics and transportation industries. Uh, it's a report on decarbonizing the supply chain. And it has, uh, it's very important to us to have actually practical steps to looking at this. So thank you.
Thank you very much. And I mean, at, at the end of the day, uh, being able to actually translate this practically along the supply chain is a fundamental element. And I think you provided great examples as we also got in terms of it, how we can use ICT technology to increase corporate and individual awareness and empowerment when, when dealing with these issues. At the same time, uh, there is the, the challenge of, of the policy framework. And um, one of the questions that uh, has arisen over the last couple of days is, how important is, is Copenhagen? How important is the, the meeting that will be taking place in December uh, at the, uh, the governmental level to try to create a framework? Uh, how hopeful are we that, there, that a framework will be coming out of that or, or conversations afterwards? And how important is that or not in terms of being able to accelerate and, and to support uh, business initiatives in this area? And perhaps, Chairman, can, could I, I get your perspective on that? In December of this year, we will have the climate summit held in Copenhagen. And through that summit, I, we understand that uh, the world is actually very curious about uh, what Korea, Korea's stance is regarding uh, the summit. We are not actually one of the, the strong powers, so to speak, in terms of uh, deciding on the, emis the carbon emission issues. However, in the, at the Hokkaido meeting, President Lee myung bak has in fact declared that we will be in fact leading the effort to reduce the emission of carbon dioxide. This in fact means that Korea is ready to be an early mover in terms of uh, carbon reduction efforts. This shows that Korea is ready to take on a more responsible leading role in the global community. As we all know, Korea is one of the top ranking trading nations in the world. And I believe President Lee myung uh, policy indicates that we are well aware of our responsibilities as such, as such a leading country. There, of course, this is of course not an easy uh, task because, as we talked about earlier on, uh, there's always local issues. We have to persuade uh, the companies back home because the companies naturally can be concerned that such reduction efforts may impact their growth strategy. So from now on until the December of this year, when the uh, climate change con uh, convention will be held in Copenhagen, I'm sure we'll be seeing a lot of efforts domestically, locally, uh, trying to persuade and uh, come to a consensus in terms of our goal. The Korean government's basic stance, well, the, the, the committee that I'm working for, the, our committee's basic stance is that the green growth will, in fact, contribute significantly to the economic development of the nation. So this will be a very strong point that we will try to convey to the, the business community here in Korea. Thank you very much. Any other points in terms of the... Um the necessity of a policy framework for corporations to be able to make an, an investment. Tarek or Victor, do you have a, a view on that? Uh, <clears throat> I, I was going to say that um, it is Copenhagen is very important from two aspects. One is that um, the global financial crisis have deflected some of the uh, political attention to the importance of uh, sorting out uh, climate change challenges. And Copenhagen is another forum to put this agenda back on the front burner. Secondly, we need something to replace Kyoto. Although, as we look at Copenhagen today, there's still a bit of 
distance we need to go in order to get a, a global consensus going forward. I think we will need a lot of ingenuity, a lot of thinking, a lot of persuasion and engagement between now and Copenhagen to get something going. There'll be something that will be plausible, but uh, it will need a lot of uh, hard work. And uh, Korea being the next chair of G20 and the leader in a green strategy obviously has a very important role to play. And I think the, um, the third way which uh, the Prime Minister mentioned earlier is something which uh, uh, could be um, the bridge to gap uh, the, um, uh, the, the, you know, between uh, the West and some of the major developing uh, nations that are still um, holding off their, um, their uh, unconditional commitment to another um, set of uh, agreed um, uh, targets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think one, one area that's really important is really the regulatory environment and the regulatory environment and the regulatory environment and the regulatory environment. A bottom-up approach is also uh, called for, and um, the, the biggest opportunity I see is in trying to get these different initiatives that are taking place in Abu Dhabi, in Singapore, and in Korea, and getting some commonality around uh, how these uh, these uh, these these approaches are being uh, approached, um, what's being learned, and what technologies made uh, make uh, make sense. And I think there's a real opportunity here to uh, somehow look at engaging um, sort of the academic stakeholders, maybe some sort of shared resources between uh, these initiatives, so that we can make sure that if there's a good idea in Singapore or a good idea in Abu Dhabi, that we have not only the, the, the opportunity for the entrepreneur, um, but the opportunity uh, for the decision makers to make the decision based on the practice of somebody else. And I think in this early stage of, of really looking at this, that's what we need to do more of, is, is get more commonality and approach and share the good ideas and practical approaches that we have. And I think that will ultimately drive the policy once we can do that. Excellent, excellent. Perhaps we can open uh, up to, to the, the audience. If I could ask you to please uh, uh, introduce yourself and then a, a very brief uh, question or comment. And perhaps we could start here. Thank you. I'm uh, uh, a governmental official from Japan. I have uh, been attending a conference and negotiations in, uh, in Bonn uh, to create a new uh, post-2012 uh, uh, framework uh, after Kyoto. I was very encouraged by the explanations made by uh, uh, the chair, uh, Your Excellency, Mr. Uh, the Mr. Chairman Kim, and also my friend, uh, Dr. Chu, about the positions of the two, uh, two countries, Korea and China. Uh, it was uh, surprisingly uh, very, uh, I was very pleased to hear those uh, positive positions of the two uh, countries. But I was uh, a bit queer, I was a bit surprised, I was a bit uh, confused because the positions of the two governments in the negotiations is very, uh, is very hesitating, I would say. Uh, Korea, although uh, a member of the OECD country, still hesitates to commit itself to the uh, uh, global greenhouse gas emission reductions. Uh, and China, uh, which is uh, emitting 20% of the global uh, uh, greenhouse gas, is still uh, claiming that uh, China cannot uh, commit itself to any particular uh, global gas emission reduction, uh, despite the fact that we are all heading towards uh, creating a new carbon, uh, global carbon society. Uh, well, criticizing others in public is, not, is against uh, Asian value. So it is a question, it is not a criticism. I would like to ask uh, the response from the Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take two or three, please, if I could have a. Madam. Yeah. Thank you very much. Christy Lee from Ori Investment Korea. 
Uh, this session was really uh, encouraging and um, very interesting. Um, and also to hear the views from the very senior uh, top decision maker in Korea. Um, I have a question to Tarek, uh, because you come from a different region, and you mentioned about the interest on the renewable energy, especially um, led by the Abu Dhabi in the Gulf countries. In your opinion, uh, what are some practical steps at the private sector level that we could start collaborating to work together between the Gulf countries and East Asian countries? Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. And why don't we take the third here, and then we'll turn back to the panel. Yes. <laughs> My name is Omura. Uh, I'm from uh, Japan Bank for International Cooperation. I have a question to uh, Mr. Chu. Uh, you mentioned the cooperation among China, uh, Korea, and J Japan is very important in this area. I fully agree with you. And I, I would uh, include the Middle East because we have strong relationship uh, concerning the Middle East. My question is, uh, you mentioned political, uh, our political leaders uh, will meet uh, together. One of the agenda uh, is to discuss this issue. My question to you is, um, what about business sector? Uh, what kind of uh, concrete uh, cooperation is uh, necessary among uh, three uh, countries? And what kind of policy uh, would be effective to enhance uh, such cooperation? Excellent. So why don't we, the issue of really collaboration and cooperation uh, bet between businesses and, and also uh, bet between governments. And I just actually should note, before turning it back to the panel, uh, Tarek had mentioned a decarbonization of the supply chain initiative of the transportation uh, group of the World Economic Forum, which actually was looking at that. And this will be one of the key issues of how do we accelerate collaboration and sharing um, of this. And actually at the meeting, the summer Davos in, uh, in, in Dalian in, in September, it will be one of the critical issues. But Tarek, perhaps you could, first of all, uh, add to the, the issue of well, how do we have practical steps for collaboration and how do we think about that? Well, I, I first think if you're, if you're a country like Singapore um, and where there's issues of water, uh, um, issues uh, that uh, are clearly very important to, to address. There may not necessarily be the scale in Singapore to commercialize an opportunity around th that's ultimately needed to make this sort of, uh, uh, make a technology or business uh, viable. So I think it's, 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 it's important and I think in the context of a project that we were looking at, I'll give you a live example of what we uh, proposed uh, was, was with respect to to uh, Mustar, um, what we had proposed is that we that we establish uh, 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 an endowed professorship uh, around the area of uh, green um, uh, logistics and sustainability huh. that would somehow link together key stakeholders in in countries like uh, Singapore and Abu Dhabi, uh, as as well as uh, uh, you know, and, and this is uh, uh, hopefully uh, Korea and Japan, where there would be a resource that would have counterparts in other countries that would be able to share ideas and, and leverage some of the activity that's going on. So, I mean, if you would take, for example, Korea, um, I'm not sh sure if there is a single person or single body that's responsible for all of the government's initiatives um, uh, on decarbonization. So it would be very difficult for an outsider to really come in and actually leverage what's going uh, happening on the ground here without having that single window uh, or that single sort of business owner that has knowledge of all of those uh, activities. So the, very, the practical steps are, let's make sure that in each um, country that there is a single resource that's actually compiling and really um, uh, responsible for uh, putting all of these um, um, initiatives together and then having uh, another mechanism where we can share those uh, uh, either uh, at the level of a uh, university or a business school curriculum, but uh, you know that way we get really some tremendous leverage. Now, what about this? The, the challenge then of it, at, on the one hand, very strong uh, commitments in terms of actual investments, both in China and Korea, and engagements at the microeconomic level, some some real developments, but also at the same time an apparent reticence um, in terms of the international negotiations. Um, Victor Chu or, or Chairman Kim, would you like to, to comment on, on those questions? 
아까 그 질문에 관련해서 In relation to the question, allow me to 그 어떤 대목을 놓쳤는지 모르겠지만 I don't know if there are any part that I have missed, but let me re-emphasize once again. Korea has made commitment to decarbonization. And I believe the gentleman from Japan said that Korea is reluctant and very hesitant to cut the carbon emission. But that's not true. Let me emphasize once again, that's not true. In our presidential committee, we need to do the accounting job to reduce the carbon. And let me stress once again that, that we are very active in reducing greenhouse gas emission carbon accounting issue, I believe, is a confidential task, right? Therefore, we don't really know what other countries are doing regarding the carbon emission accounting. But in case of Korea, together with the reliable organization worldwide, we are trying to address this carbon decarbonization very actively. We try to do a lot of research, gather information, so that we can cut the carbon emission. Just in case you're still worried about Korea's reluctant positions regarding cutting carbon emission, that's far from the truth. That's not truth, once again. According to the information that I gathered, the chairman from China, too, has clarified that China is also very committed to address environmental issues. And geographically, China and Korea is very close. And China's active role and uh, commitment is very encouraging. In case of China, as Mr. Ju said, in terms of the energy efficiency, China made a great progress. We hear often that China is making a great achievement using energy efficiently and reducing the carbon will make a great contribution in developing the economy at the same time addressing the environmental issues it's like killing two birds with one stone and as far as what we know worldwide the country with more than five thousand us dollar per income per capita income when that happens then most of the consumers or the people in that country turn to environmental protection and they become very environmental friendly people. In case of Korea, our uh, GMP uh, per capita income is around $4,000. Therefore, we will make further progress in the future. I can confidently declare once again that we will make greater progress. In terms of the collaborations with the neighboring countries, I'm sure that it is currently being done on a corporate level, on a business level, but also at the government level, we are doing that. We visited Mongolia some time ago, and we did a lot of planting work there because the desert in Mongolia has a serious problems with the yellow dust. And this yellow dust is giving a bad impact to us, and people suffer there as well. So we actually visited this desert area in Mongolia, and we tried to do a lot of planting activity with Chinese government. And cases like this, Korea and Japan, uh, Korea and China will further strengthen our collaboration. And I'm sure that we can do it together with Japan. Because of the geographical uh, locations between Korea, Japan, and China, the environmental problem in China is the environmental problem of Korea and vice versa. In case of the, the forest area, there are a lot of areas where Korea can play the role. Thank you. Thank you. Um, maybe I can deal with the question from my two uh, learned friends from Japan. Uh, Ambassador, I'm very grateful for, for your question. Uh, as I mentioned in my remarks, there is still a bit of a gap, obviously, uh, in, in China's position uh, in Copenhagen. I think we're getting there. I think w what we have to bear in mind is the, the capacity of a big developing country in subscribing to uh, international benchmarks. There's always a, a challenge here. So I think some kind of a third way, um, which is being floated uh, right now, uh, could be the answer in, uh, in bridging the gap. And, and I'm sure with the support of uh, uh, Japan and Korea, uh, China will, 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 will get there. There'll be something that we'll get from Copenhagen, but I, I, I don't think we should have very high expectation that we will get there easily. Um, it's a challenging task, 
Um, and as far as, uh, uh, I don't speak for the Chinese government uh, for that matter, but obviously uh, I have an understanding of uh, China's challenge and its position. China is genuinely uh, engaged and committed to the whole climate change issue, right from uh, at the very top, from the Prime Minister and uh, from the President's level. And I think the country as a whole, the cultural shift, as I say, um, is at the right direction. But it needs to be satisfied that it has the necessary capacity to get to um, international agreed benchmark. So with the goodwill from all sides, I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll get there uh, sooner or later. As far as my Japanese friend um, talking about how the business side can cooperate, I think there's some uh, positive uh, developments uh, um, uh, recently. Five years ago, it, it, it was very difficult to structure um, a business uh, partnership because there is a real financing cost in introducing uh, uh, green projects, as we know. Now, when we ask our Chinese colleagues to introduce energy efficiency technology or energy conservation scheme, the question is, how, how do we pay for it? Because we don't have budget for these expensive but highly technological um, uh, solutions. Now today, I think we have, we have um, a glimpse of hope. It, and that is the, where the investment world, uh, private sector investment will come in. Because today, we are able to demonstrate to the Chinese uh, um, local uh, uh, governments that the cost savings derived from energy efficiency schemes and technology over a period of time can easily pay for the cost up front. So where you need to do is a private sector uh, solution come in between. For example, a company like mine, we will be very happy to finance an energy efficiency uh, a project, provided the, we have a, um, a, a, a take off uh, from the local government, uh, off-take, sorry, and also provided we have certain guarantees and comfort from the uh, provider of the technology that um, it will deliver. And I think now we are very close in getting this, that situation. As I mentioned, a lot of green funds is being raised internationally and regionally and very soon in China. And where would those green funds invest? And it's exactly working with local governments in effecting these private sector uh, solutions. And I see Japanese companies and Korean companies will have a lot of potential in working with Chinese companies and investors uh, in those um, uh, partnerships. So I think uh, we're getting there, and the potential are huge. And Chuck Ito, could I ask for, for your comments sir, on this issue of um, the advances in technology, meaning that now green innovation increasingly can be paid for by itself. Uh, and, and to what extent uh, people, whether governments or investment funds, prepared to support the investments required for uh, ICT or other technologies that actually can accelerate uh, the greening of growth? Uh, I'd like to mention uh, the, about from uh, the IT industry point of view. Uh, fortunately, uh, the Japan, Korea, Japan, and China, the Eastern, East, Eastern Asia, the so many IT-related, excellent so many IT-related companies here. And then, uh, in that sense, and, uh, we like to have a most, more closely collaboration in terms of R&D to reduce the carbon emission. And also, I believe the global warming issue should be uh, the energy security issue. If we can uh, reach the target of carbon emission reduction, we can reduce the energy cost. It, it's provided a great benefit, not only you know, for the company, not on, uh, but also the uh, country and the people. That is my idea. Very good. Well, thank you very much. I think over the last hour and 15 minutes, we've heard uh, a, a real tour de force on, on this issue, starting with the Prime Minister and the commitment of the Korean government, and also his personal commitment in his previous role as Special Envoy on Climate Change, um, together with 
the uh, international and uh, intersectoral perspectives we had before us, uh, to me, four elements came out very clearly. If attitude is critical, the attitudes from the individual consumer right up to the prime minister of the country and key corporate leaders is one of, I think, a very solid and increasing awareness of this, uh, despite uh, the challenges of, of the global economic crisis we're going through. And that's probably different than any other downturn we've had before. Typically, in other downturns, environmental issues have been put aside. Uh, that does not seem to be the case with this downturn. The second element is uh, obviously key policy issues, not only in terms of international commitments, but in terms of pricing and in terms of uh, fiscal incentives, uh, whether cyclical or structural, play a key element in that. And it appears that governments from China, Korea, Japan are playing an important part on that, as they are internationally. The third, though, that came out very clearly is the strong commitment and engagement of the corporate sector and an opportunity, perhaps, to uh, make even more efficient the market for the exchange of best practices, uh, not only in terms of technologies, but in terms of know-how, the application of these technologies across different sectors. And the fourth element is that Asian leadership uh, in this, as in so many other areas, will be increasingly important. First of all, because there's such a, a, a need, uh, both from the point of view of where the growth of uh, CO2 emissions will come in the future, but also the energy security issues which both for Korea and Japan and China are of fundamental issues. So for uh, traditional national security, as well as for uh, forward-looking global security around climate change issues, there's a strong incentive and imperative to act on this. And at the same time, there's the, the base of technology and the fiscal wherewithal to actually uh, drive these types of, of changes as well. So both in terms of needs and in terms of solutions, I think we can look forward to increasing Asian leadership uh, on this issue. Uh, it only remains to me to, on, on behalf of everyone here, to thank our extraordinary panel for their thoughtful comments. Thank you very much.